Okay, so as we proceed through this series, considering men and women in the Bible, as we've mentioned, what we're doing in this series is seeing God's abiding faithfulness in and through the lives of these people. Now we come across a somewhat controversial figure, uh, Saul. You know, he was the first anointed king uh, for Israel, and I believe it was a judgment. Uh, I believe he rose Saul up as a judgment for the people because they were asking for a king. Remember, we considered that last week that God is their king and they asked for another. And it wasn't so much asking for a king, as we discussed, but it was that they wanted to be like other nations. And what we're going to see, and through because we're going to summarize most of this, since we have six chapters as, as we continue going through, we're going to have to summarize these more. So, you know, when I ask you to read these portions, it's impar- it's somewhat imperative that you actually do read them because we will skate through some of these. Um, But again, going back to, I think Saul was risen up as a judgment. He's he's faithful for a time, as we'll see. Uh, He's actually called to be a prince at first, and then he delivers Israel out of their enemies, and then he's anointed king. And then after that is when he falls. However, again, just to set this up very briefly, and especially going into the following message, we are going to consider, we are going to start to consider God's disciplining and chastening of his people. As far as the context of our next message, that's in and what, how it's defined in and through salvation, okay? However, let's remember that, again, this is a judgment for the people to teach them a lesson, that God is their king. Ultimately, even when he anoints David, it's to be under the kingship of God himself. Okay, but right now we are going to consider Saul. And like I said, that you know, two weeks ago, we're going to see Samuel throughout the account of Saul and throughout the account of David. So we're going to end just before the anointing of David. And and then, I mean, we're going to peek in a little bit uh, in that narrative as well. However, we'll we'll see Saul a lot during our series over David. We're going to have four messages, God willing, uh, considering David. And again, we're going to have to kind of breeze through some of that and pick and choose what narratives to to, uh, follow. However, with that somewhat of an introduction, what I want to do is kind of summarize chapter 9, as we go into chapter 10, and I'll summarize part of chapter 10. However, since y'all read it, we all know that, that Saul was taught, he was, he was from the tribe of Benjamin. His father was very wealthy. He was taller than everybody else, and he was more handsome than everybody else. Okay, Now, that's a foreshadowing, just so you know. Uh, one of David's sons, Absalom defects from him, he rebels against him and takes his kingdom for a time, and he was also very handsome, and he made these memorials for himself, these statues, as we'll see Saul did as well. So this is, this is a foreshadowing. So David has to deal with two figures like this on either side of his kingdom. One, Saul becomes something of a father to David, as we'll see in the weeks to come, God willing. However, his son, then his son rises up against him, you know, which, which was a very sad ordeal, as we'll, as we'll consider, God willing, in the weeks to come. Okay, so the summary, though, of, of chapter 9, again, Saul, his father was Kish, and he was a wealthy man. Now, they lose their donkeys, right? His father loses his donkeys. Now, this is to signify that, he, that Saul wasn't all that great of a shepherd, okay? We'll see David is a very faithful uh, shepherd. However, his father sends Saul out to go find the donkeys. He sends him out with his servant, and all of a sudden, you know, they go through all these lands, and they can't find him. And then Saul says, all right, we we need to turn back because my my father's going to start worrying about us. You know, we need to turn back. So he's also, again, not a faithful shepherd, leaving the 99 and pursuing without end to find these animals, okay? So, however, his servant insists that, hey, let's go to the city. That's where the seer is. At this time, they call the prophets seers because they're able to foretell what's to come. And so he says, let's go see the seer. And 
uh, Saul thinks that's a good idea, but he says, well, you know, we don't have any bread anymore. We, just, we already ate everything that we had. I don't have anything to give. And his servant does. He has a little bit of money. Now, we don't see that Samuel actually accepted that. But, you know, in their mind, they think that th this is what you would do. Right. I mean, if you would go to a foreteller, you go to get your fortune told, there's an exchange there. Well, with the prophets, if you when you read the Old Testament, Elijah, Elisha refused monetary compensation, any kind of compensation, really. So I find it very unlikely that Samuel actually received that. Again, it's not said in the narrative. However, so they do. Right. They do. They go. They go they ask uh, uh, a woman, you know, if, if Samuel is there and she says yeah, he's coming basically for the feast, you know, and we're, we have to wait for him so that he can bless the feast. So they're having a huge feast. OK. And they say, OK, great. And they as they go up the hill, here comes Samuel. OK. Now, Samuel was told by God the previous day that he's going to run into the man that God has chosen to be a prince, to be a prince and a deliverer from the Philistines, remember, and he says, I've heard the people cry out. And let's remember, that was the, the pattern through the book of Judges, really throughout the, the biblical record. There are these deliverers, and we need to see the point. As we go into the Christmas season, and we'll emphasize this more and more, all these judges, all these deliverers are, are risen up. God anoints these people to save them from an enemy, from the hand of an enemy, from a hand of an, a physical enemy. Christ was risen up, was anointed, was sent to be a deliverer, the deliverer from our greatest enemy that we can never defeat. Okay, these Philistines, I mean, if the people would have been more faithful and, you know, they at least have the physical prowess, they at least have a chance, you know, we have no chance against sin and death. Christ was the ultimate deliverer. Again, we will get back to that in weeks to come, God willing. However, so Saul, God is raising up Saul to be a prince, to be the deliverer for now, to deliver them from the hand of the Philistines. Okay, now, now. It's not set up right here in the beginning, but we will see that the Philistines harshly oppress the Israelites. And, and if we consider last week when there was a 20 year period that we didn't, you know, there was no historical record. But then all of a sudden the people began to cry aloud for, for a deliverer, for a deliverance, for Samuel to help them deliver them out of the hand of the Philistines. And then God sent thunder and then that routed them away. OK, so so and then so Samuel's telling uh, Saul, you, you know, basically, you know, is not all the good in the land for you and your family, basically you and your father's house. And Saul is saying, Saul says, am I not of the least of the tribes, Benjamin? Remember, we briefly talked about now and I and I'd encourage you because we're not going to look we're not going to look at that account very much. But towards the end of Judges, the tribe of Benjamin does great wickedness, great wickedness, and they're almost completely annihilated from the other tribes. There's a civil war, really, and the other tribes almost destroy them entirely. And, you know, from their own faithfulness, actually, the tribe of Benjamin continues. So we'll see there's a bit, bunch of consternation about Saul being anointed king, and I think that's partly why. So that's the brief kind of backdrop in, in chapter 9. Uh, and also, remember, they were having that feast, and Samuel sat Saul and his servant at the place of honor. Okay? Now, remember when we were talking about Christ telling the people never to sit in the place of honor. You sit at the place of least honor and have the, have the host bring you up to where you belong. Well, Samuel sits them at the place of honor, probably at the head of the table, Either way, they are both at the place of honor. Samuel had had the, perf the, the, the primary portion of the meat. It's called a shank. It's like the leg. It's kind of a thigh. The best portion, which was really meant for the priests. But he had the, the, he had the cook kind of hold that back for a while until Saul came. And he gave that to Saul. And he, and he was able to eat it. Now, So this is to signify to the people that something special was with Saul. That's what Samuel's getting across to Saul and the people. Okay, so there are about 30 guests in this area, and they're all leaders. They're all, you know, powerful um, men kind of a thing at, at that time. And Saul is put in the place of honor. Okay, but he's, 
He's reluctant with this honor at first. And I don't think it's humility. I think it's reluctance. I just don't think he wants to be the deliverer. Remember, Gideon was somewhat hesitant. We, basically, it's not my job. You know, just like he said, am I not from the least of the tribes, Benjamin? And basically, he's just saying, it's not my job. You know, ultimately, the scepter is supposed to come out of Judah anyway. And he, pro he knows that. And so he's, he's reluctant, basically. He just doesn't think he should be the one called for this. So, uh, also chapter going into chapter 10. So Sa uh, Samuel, you know, tells, uh, tells Saul, um, you know, have your servant go on. They, you know, he sleeps on the roof first, and then he wakes him up early. Samuel goes and cries out to him early and says, send your, send your servant on. And he does, and at that time, Samuel anoints his head with oil and anoints him prince, okay, over all of Israel. Again, you're called to deliver, you know, from the hands of the Philistines, but you are anointed. Um, okay, and again, so, and then he start, and then he tells him, this is what's going to happen. Once you leave here, you know, you're going to run into three men. One is going to be carrying three goats. The other one is going to be carrying three loaves of bread. And the other one is going to be carrying a skin of wine. These men are going for an offering, a great offering. This is all, that's everything you would need and then some. But he had, they have three goats for the three men, three loaves of bread for the three men, and then a skin of wine for the three men and the priests. Okay. Now when, and then Saul, I mean, uh, Samuel told Saul that when you run into these fellas, they're going to give you two loaves of bread. That is also meant for the priests. Okay, so, so what, we, what we need to recognize here is what Samuel is doing is kind of, kind of handing over his authority to Saul and he's trying he's showing Saul and he's showing the people that this is how that this is what's going on I am transferring the authority we just we remember the people have cried out for a king and Samuel said okay God is going to raise up a king for you however you know right now we this is the transition period okay so let's go ahead and read um, chapter 10 verses 5 through um, 13 after that, you shall come to the hill of God where the Philistine garrison is. And it will happen when you have come there to the city that you will meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place with a stringed instrument, a tambourine, a flute, and a harp before them, and they will be prophesying. Now, so this is a different kind of prophesying, okay? So just like we were talking about last week that music is a gift from God, these people are actually ministering to the people this is what this means by prophesying they're ministering to the people with music with this music and again this is a foreshadowing into david he's able to play a stringed instrument to soothe saul for a time he's a, and he writes all these psalms and probably conducts the music there are these elements in the titles of the song where you know david says to use this kind of instrument we don't know exactly what they were but he's a musician okay and he's a great writer and so this is also a foreshadowing however these prophets are going around and singing the praise of god to minister to the people. So there's just a different kind of prophesying. Then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you, and you will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. And let it be when these signs come to you that you do as the occasion demands, for God is with you. You shall go down before me to Gilgal, and surely I will come down to you offer, to offer burnt offerings and make sacrifices of peace, peace offerings. Seven days you shall wait till I come to you and show you what you should do. So it was when he had turned his back to go from Samuel that God gave him another heart, and all those signs came to pass that day. So here we go. God is starting to change his heart. Okay, he's starting to change his heart. Then or when they came there to the hill there was a group of prophets to meet him then the spirit of god came upon him and he prophesied among them and it happened when all who knew him formerly saw that he indeed prophesied among the prophets that the people said to one another what is this that has that has come upon the son of kish is saul also among the prophets then a man from there answered and said but who is their father therefore it became a proverb is saul also among the prophets and when he finished prophesying, he went to the high place. So this is kind of, 
this is somewhat demeaning. This is somewhat of a pejorative. This proverb isn't, you know, a compliment to Saul. What they're saying is, again, they're already having a problem that this is a Benjamite. But again, Saul is very great. He's very wealthy. And the prophets in those times typically weren't. You know, they lived a simple life. You know, I mean, we, we remember John the Baptist, you know, nothing but, you know, camel skin and all raggedy, you know, and only ate locusts and honey. The, 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 the prophets typically lived an ascetic life. In other words, you know, bereft of any wine or any good kind of food, any kind of great clothing. Isaiah was very prominent in his time, so he's kind of an exception, so there are exceptions. However, uh, they're, they're wondering about this. Is even Saul among the prophets? What's going on here? Okay, and then, you know, uh, um, so, so uh, Samuel, uh, Saul goes to the high place, uh, runs into his uncle. His uncle asks, you know, where have you been? And he said, you know, we were looking for the donkeys. And then, they, you know, he asked, well, what happened? And they said, well, we went to go see Samuel. And his uncle asked, well, what did Samuel say? And all that Saul told him was that he told us that the donkeys were found. He said nothing about his anointing. He's, this is not humility, okay? This would signify, this would imply humility. This is a reluctance that I can understand. As we all know, there was a reluctance also with me. This is, that's a sin. That's a sin, okay? He's basically not wanting to, to do this because it's not his job. He doesn't want to do it. He doesn't, you know, he's, his first thought isn't the people, it isn't God, it's himself. It's what he wants to do and what he wants to be, okay? This is a reluctance. He just refuses to accept the calling for now, for now. And this is after God has already changed his heart. He's changed him, he's changing him into a new man. And he's still reluctant at that point. Okay, all right, so chapter 11, okay, chapter 11 starts with, Nahash, the, the Amorite or Ammonite. So, and there's a portion of the scriptures that are missing here that were in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So there's a portion that, that actually gives us more information that there was a war previous to this, this narrative in the beginning of uh, chapter 11 where the Israelites did fight against this king and he cut out all of their right eyes. And so then, then uh, the, the, the people of Jabesh, so the Israelites of Jabesh, said to Nahash, make a covenant with us and we will serve you. And Nahash the Ammonite answered them, on this condition I will make a covenant with you that I may pull out all your right eyes and bring, bring reproach on all Israel. Okay. Now, that's not a cruel little punishment. I mean, I know that, I mean, that doesn't sound nice. However, this is tactical, okay? When, you, when your right eye is gouged out and you try to use a shield, you can't see anything, you know? So basically, he's making it to where there will be no rebellion. There will be no, you know, coup d'etat. That's not going down, okay? Basically, that's fine. You can come and serve me, but on, on, the, on the basis that I'm able to cut out all of your right eyes, okay? Now... We're going to read verses 4 through 11. So the messengers came to Gibeah of Saul and told the news in the hearing of the people. And all the people lifted up their voices and wept. Now there was Saul coming behind the herd from the field. And Saul said, What troubles the people that they weep? And they told him the words of the men of Jabesh. Uh, then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Saul when he heard this news, and his anger was greatly aroused. So... God is starting to change his heart. Now he's starting to care about the people. His anger is greatly aroused. He's offended by this. Just like uh, David was uh, offended at, the, at uh, the Goliath cursing Israel. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Basically, Saul has the same anger, the same frustration. Who is this guy? Who is this guy threatening the people? Okay, so his anger is greatly aroused. So he took a yoke of oxen and cut them in pieces and set them through all the territory of Israel by the hands of a of messenger, saying, Whoever does not go out with Saul and Samuel to battle, so it shall be done to his oxen. If you read the end of Judges, there's a Levite who, there's a terrible account of the Benjamites raping and killing a woman, a concubine. And this Levite, cuts her in 12 pieces to send to the other tribes to wake them up to battle. 
okay? Because again, as we saw in the book of Judges, there was such a reluctance for this, but that does rise, cause all the people to rise up and almost annihilate Benjamin. So this is kind of a similar, similar ordeal. Saul is basically threatening the people. He's not, like we saw with Barak, like we saw with Gideon, going around and blowing the trumpets and compelling people to come down. Samuel had warned the people that the king will demand, the, com the king will demand that your sons will fight in the battle. Basically be conscripted. This is not a volunteered action. Basically, so shall it be with anybody who doesn't come down. All you are going to be cut in pieces if you don't come. This is a threat. This is a threat that we haven't seen. Okay? So he's, all, he's not being, he's a troubled man here, okay? Part of him is starting to change. God is starting to change his heart. But he's still a sinner. And like we mentioned two weeks ago, there is a choice between serving sin and serving God. He sees himself as ser serving God in this, but this is a terrible threat that, that's, that's not befitting of a, of a faithful king. David never does anything like this, okay? And Christ obviously would never do anything like this. He's, he's conscripting the people. He's forcing them to come down at the threat of death, okay? And the fear of the Lord fell on the people, and they came out with one consent. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> you know, that'll do it. When he numbered them in Bezek, the children of Israel were 300,000 and the men of Judah 30,000. Let's remember that. Let's put that back in our memory bank because that will diminish quickly. And they said to the messengers who came, Thus you shall say to the men of Jab Jabesh Gilead, Tomorrow by the time the sun is hot, you shall have help. Then the messengers came and reported it to the men of Jab Jabesh, and they were glad. Therefore the men of Jabesh said, Tomorrow we will come out to you, so to Naabash, Naash, uh, and you may do with us whatever seems good to you. So it was on the next day uh, that Saul put the people in three companies, and they came into the midst of the camp in the morning watch and killed Ammonites until the heat of the day. And it happened that those who survived were scattered and so that no, no two of them were left together. So here's a great deliverance. Here's a great deliverance from Saul. And then everybody gets excited. Everybody gets excited. Okay, so then the people said to Samuel, who is he who said, shall Saul reign over us? So basically, there were some people who were saying, who were against this. Again, he's a Benjamite. I think some from the tribe of Judah had a huge problem with this. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. The, the prophecy of Jacob in his blessing said, Judah will be the kingdom, basically, through the tribe of Judah. Benjamin, there was nothing about Benjamin. So I think they had a problem. However, the people are now upset. They're basically saying, who said, shall Saul reign over us? Bring them out that we can kill them immediately. They tell Samuel this. And Saul, Saul says, um, not a man shall be put to death this day. For today, the Lord has accomplished salvation in Israel. There's the spirit of God in this man. Okay. He threatened on the one hand. And then once the, after the deliverance, this is great, this is wonderful, but we have to see the friction going on. We have to see what's going on in the heart of this man. We're on the, we're in the beginning, he threatens all the people to come down, again, at the threat of death, and then all of a sudden, they're saying, we need to kill any of the re rebels, and he says, no, nobody's going to die today because God has uh, uh, performed this um, um, Great salvation in Israel. Now, again, we are trying to breeze through these things, okay? So let's, we're going to kind of summarize chapter 12, kind of overall summarize um, chapter 12. So Samuel comes and challenges the people. Again, he has transferred his authority to Saul. So he comes out and he challenges them. Any of you, have I stolen anything from you? Have I taken anything from you? Have I taken a donkey? Have I taken anything, any piece of property at all? Have I, have I, you know, betrayed you in any way? Have I done anything? And, and you witness against me in front of the anointed, and I, and I will repay you. You know, if you, if you can, can come up with something, I'll make it right. And they say, we, no, you haven't done anything against, against us like that. And he says, confirm it in the presence of the, the Lord's anointed, which is Saul. And, and, and they say, yes, we're all witnesses, and he's a witness. Okay, so then he starts to tell them that... Um, uh, he starts to tell them of God's past deliverances. He starts with Egypt. Then he goes in through the book of Judges. There's 
different names for Barack. So one is still Barack, but he goes through the history. Remember, we made that a point when whenever you want to encourage the people, especially for obedience and or repentance, the prophets always went back to the deliverances of God. That's what sustains the people. He starts to preach the word of God, everything that God had done, his faithfulness, his abiding faithfulness, and his deliverances in and through all of these different men, including Samuel, and basically saying, okay, now this is going to the hand of Saul. And basically, just like chapter 28 in Deuteronomy, he says, if you will obey and if you will follow the Lord, then the Lord will be with you and your king forever. But if you do not obey, then curses will be upon you. Okay? And we will see, as time goes on, the people and the kings start to fall away. Start to fall away. And that's where the plagues and the, and the pestilences and God's judgment increase. And in the tribe of Judah, though, in the southern kingdom, there are times of faithful kings, so they last a little bit longer, and their captivity is much shorter. Again, as we'll see. However, Samuel is already, is already um, imploring them, obey, obey. And we're going to see that in chapter 15 as well. So, moving to chapter 13. Okay, first, verse, first six verses, Jonathan basically attacks the Philistine garrison. Word gets around and everybody thinks Saul attacked it, and they know that they're an abomination in the eyes of the Philistines. So they got all scared, okay? So let's start with... Um, uh, verse, well, kind of towards the end of verse 7. Uh, As for Saul, he was still in Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. Then he waited seven days according to the time set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal. Remember, he had told him, wait seven days. And the people were scattered from him. Uh, oh, also, we, uh, this, this is where we're introduced to Jonathan. I love Jonathan. As we will see, he is a faithful faithful friend to David. So we're just going to wait for that because I could just go off about <laughs> Jonathan. I love Jonathan. I, you know, they have this relationship that, 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 that is befitting, that is wonderful for any man uh, to have in their life. They're, they're close like brothers um, and they're committed to each other. However, we're introduced to Jonathan here. Jonathan is very faithful, very faithful to God. He's faithful to his father, um, he, he has these moments where it seems like he rebels against his father, but for the good of the people, but we're going to kind of consider that's not necessarily what's going on. And he's also, fa he becomes faithful to David. Okay. So Saul said, so, but Samuel did not come down to Gilgal. So Saul said, bring a burnt, burnt offering and peace offerings here to me. And he offered the burnt offering. Now what happened, as soon as he finished presenting the burnt offering, as Samuel came, and so Saul went out to meet him, that he might greet him. Saul is not a priest. No matter what Samuel was implying with giving him the shank, and with, with, with having the prophets give him the two pieces of bread, the two loaves of bread, he is not a priest. He is not a Levite. This is not for him to do. This is a great sin. A terrible transgression that he knew he knew better regarding okay so just after he offers it here comes Samuel Samuel shows up right after and Samuel says what have you done Saul said when I saw that the people were scattered from me listen listen he never he never repents he never says it's him he just like Adam and Eve blames another just like men and women typically do when, 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 they're, when they're struck and convicted, they don't like it. And they make up a, a ton of excuses. And to the extent that they can blame somebody else, they do. And that's exactly what Saul did. When I saw that the people were scattered from me and that you did not come within the days appointed. So in other words, you didn't come down in the days that you told me. You know, the people were starting to take off. Remember, they had, they had 300,000 and then 30,000 in Judah. And those are all starting to scatter. So basically Saul is saying, you know, I was losing a bunch of men. You didn't come when, when you said you were going to come. And that the Philistines gathered together in Mishpash. You know, they're about to attack us. Had to do something. And, you know, then I said, the Philistines will now come down on me at Gilgal. And I have not made supplication to the Lord. Therefore, I felt compelled and offered burnt offering. 
So what he's saying is, you know, hey, I figured the Philistines were going to attack and I need, we needed to make supplications to the Lord and make sure he's going to fight for us. And, so, and you hadn't come down. The people are taken off. So I felt compelled to make the burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. And Samuel arose and went up to Gilgal to Gibeah of Benjamin. And Saul numbered the people present with him, about 600 men. There were 300,000. There were 30,000. Now there are 600. In the sin of Saul, it is Saul's sin that leads to the scattering, to the, to, to the, the crazy drop in the numbers. If he, God says, I will honor those who honor me. This was, Saul did that which was completely dishonorable to God, complete offense toward God. This is not for his hand to do. He wanted to make him something of a Christ himself. Remember, Christ is the King of Kings. He's our great high priest, and he is the, pro the prophet that pro Moses promised. And so Saul's basically trying, you know, he's already prophesying. He's now anointed king. There's only one thing left. And he tries to make himself out to be a priest and then blame it on everybody else. So God will not honor him. And the number of men with him goes down to 600. And he'll be able to get some more. But, okay, now briefly, the end of chapter 13, basically. So this is to indicate how, how harsh the oppression of the Philistines were. Basically, they made it to where none of the Israelites were allowed to have weapons. We see this in our own time. So nobody is able to defend themselves against other men against robbers and thieves and, and murderers, and they're not allowed to defend themselves from in, invasions because the Philistines, you know, don't want that. They don't want a, they don't want a, a, a rebellion either. And so they make it to where none of them have swords. And if, you're gonna, if you need your, you know, uh, sickle sharpened or your plowshare or any of these, then you're going to be charged a great sum. You're going to have to go up to somewhere, you know, where the uh, Philistines are controlling that area. And it's going to be very expensive, but not one of you will have a sword. Only Jonathan and Saul have a sword. Okay. And there's much I'd like to say about that, but however, we are breezing through this, so God willing, we come back to this uh, account and, the, and of this narrative. But this is a terrible oppression. This is a terrible tyranny to take, to take defensive um, weapons from the hands of innocent men or women. None of these people were murderers. None of these people were felons. None of these people were stealing anything, and they just take it. Because they, they know that that makes them more open to be destroyed. Okay? And we see that in our own time. Okay, chapter 14. We're going to summarize somewhat chapter 14. Again. All right. So, it's Jonathan. John, so, you know, Jonathan. Everybody's kind of scared because the Philistines are surround. The Philistines kind of surround them. Okay? And they're overwhelmed. And Saul is very reluctant to fight. Jonathan tells his servant, his armor bearer really, let's go up to the garrison, all right? And, and when we get there, you know, if the Philistines come out to, and call us up there, then we know that the Lord has delivered them into our hands. If, if they start to come down to us, well, we have an issue, okay? However, so the armor bearer says, do what is right in your, in your eyes. You know, I will follow you. Armor bearers are supposed to be very faithful servants to their, the, uh, the person to whom they're uh, bearing the armor. So he goes with them. And first, John, the, then they, they arrive there. And, and all the, the people, the people who had scattered, hid in caves, fled to these other areas, just like we saw in the book of Judges. And so they, they come to the garrison, and, and the Philistines look down, and they're like, oh, they're starting to come out of their little caves. Ooh, they're kind of starting to come out of their hiding places. And so they say, hey, come on up here. We got something to show you. They're trying to, 
you know, and trap them, basically. And Jonathan says, this is fantastic. The Lord has delivered them into our hands. So he goes up there, starts to kill, you know, most, m many of the people. The armor bearer follows close behind, and they destroy, they, they kill about an acre full of men. As this is happening, word gets back to, you know, because everything is going crazy. And so the camp of Israel is wondering what's going on. And so they don't know who, you know, they don't know who's missing. So basically Saul says, take an account, see who's missing. And it's told to him that Jonathan is missing. Okay. So now when the, the, the Philistines are just lost and they don't know what's going on, Men, so many of the Israelites had defected to the Philistines, okay? And those people turn again and start serving the Israelites. And they start killing the Philistines as well. And all the people who were hiding, all the people who were taken off, came back. They came back and fought the Philistines on account of Jonathan, not on account of Saul, okay? Okay, so that's... Uh, very brief sum summary of uh, chapter 14. So to summarize chapter f the first nine uh, verses of chapter 15, God commands Saul to destroy the Amalekites. Okay, we are going to consider this somewhat in our next message, okay, because he is commanded to kill all the livestock, all the men, all the women, all the children, everybody. Now the reason for this dates back to the Exodus, okay? Uh, the Amalek or the Amalekites had attacked the Israelites from behind. They were not provoked, and the Amalekites were huge, and they were not provoked, and they attacked. And that's when, I don't know if you're familiar with this uh, story, but uh, uh, Moses has to lift up his staff for a time, you know, until the battle's won. And so Joshua and, his, and Moses' brother Aaron helps ho him hold it up, okay, until the Amalekites are defeated. However, they weren't utterly defeated. And so, and God promised that they will be judged, that the, he will cast them completely off because he is sovereign, because he is sovereign. However, so that's what happens. So he commands Saul to do this. Saul agrees, okay, and he goes, and they destroy all the men, all the women, all the children, most of the livestock, but the choice livestock, they kept for themselves. And the king Agag, uh, Saul also spared. Okay, now let's start at verse 10. Now, the, so that's, again, a great summary of that. But they spared the, the choice flocks and they spared Agag. Now the word of the Lord came to Samuel saying, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king, and for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried out to the Lord all night. So when Samuel, real quickly, again, let's recognize the heart of Samuel. Remember, he had been reluctant to tell uh, Eli that terrible news, the judgment that's coming to his sons and his household, his family, his family line, his lineage. And this grieves Samuel's heart. You know, he, he's at first somewhat excited that, you know, God has anointed this man as king. He's tall. He's handsome. He's everything that you would expect from a king. He makes, the, he causes this great deliverance. And yeah, Saul fell away with making that offering. But, but Samuel is hoping that, you know, eventually Saul will repent and the Lord will restore his kingdom to Saul. So this, this grieves Samuel. And he cried out to the Lord all night. So when Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul went to Carmel, and indeed he set up a monument for himself, and he has gone on around, passed by, and gone down to Gilgal. So much for that humility. That's what I'm saying. He wasn't humble. He was reluctant. Now he's embracing this way too much. And now he's all proud of himself. Now he's erecting all these monuments for himself, to have all the people remember that Saul did this. Jonathan had done it. But he's erecting these monuments for himself. Now he's compelling the people to adore him. He, he, he's commercializing himself now. You know, th this is not what a faithful king does. The faithful king serves his people. Remember, that's what Christ said. That the man who will be over you, the man who will be a master over you or, or lead you in any way, must be your slave. 
And ultimately, that's what David becomes. He is the servant. He is the shepherd of Israel. He is the man after God's own heart. Okay, Saul obviously is not. He's making monuments for himself. And Samuel went to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Saul saying, I did it. I did it. We went down there. You know, we destroyed all the people. You know, I, I did it. And, uh, but Samuel said, What then? Is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? And Saul said, they have, br- <laughs> they have brought them from the Amalekites. Again, here he goes, blaming other people. For the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. Saul was commanded to destroy all of them. He cannot pass this on to somebody else, but he's still trying to. Such is the heart of of wicked men okay and basically he and it didn't say anything about keeping the choice um, livestock in order to offer to God I think Saul's just making stuff up I mean maybe not maybe they actually did you know again we've mentioned that in these summaries sometimes things are just left out so maybe the people did say hey let's spare the livestock because that way we can offer it to God there's no reason to spare Agag okay so I think this is a lie Um, Then Samuel said to Saul, be quiet. Quit your lying. Quit your deception. This already happened. I'm I'm tired of you blaming everybody else and you not repenting yourself. Be quiet and I will tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And he said to him, speak on. So Samuel said, when you were little in your own eyes, were you not the head of the tribes of Israel? So again, when he was reluctant at first, you know, in fact, when when it was time for his anointing, they find him hiding in the baggage or the military equipment. It's fairly vague. It's vessels. So it could be a host of number of things, but it could be the baggage from everybody traveling. Anyway, he was hiding. So when you were little in your own eyes, were you not the head of the tribes? And did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? Now the Lord sent you on a mission and said, go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, But I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and gone, gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me and brought back Agag, king of Amalek. I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took of the plunder, sheep and oxen, and the best of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. He's still continuing to try to blame other people. So Samuel said, has the Lord as great has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrificing sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Let's look at Psalm 51, 16 and 17, because David actually says something. Um, somewhat similar. And that is this one. No, it's not. It must be this one. Yes, it is. Uh, 51. Oh, it's over here. Okay. And for, he's talking to God. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. This is David, the man after God's own heart. He knows, he knows that these offerings are to to symbolize God's forgiveness. Okay, God spares the sin and puts them on another, really ultimately Christ. But David knows God does not delight in the blood of bulls and goats. That's also throughout the Bible. He, did, he, des, he desires a broken and a contrite heart, an obedient heart. So Samuel says, you know, Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft, which is interesting, because we will also see Saul calling on a witch. Once Samuel dies, he, he calls on this witch to raise him up from the dead, which is a sin. So... Samuel saying, For rebellion is a sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. I will honor those who honor me. 
Those who despise me will be lightly esteemed. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me, that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. And as Samuel turned around to go away, Saul seized the edge of his robe, robe and it tore. We'll also see in, in that account when he, when he pays a witch to, to, do, to raise up Samuel from the dead, that he's dressed in his robe. I think it's the same robe that's still torn. So I think this, again, is a foreshadowing. Um, so tore, the robe is torn. So Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor relent, for he is not a man that he should relent. Then he said, I have sinned, yet honor me now. Look, this is not actual contrition. Saul is basically, he is imploring Samuel to come with him. He knows that if Samuel doesn't come with him, that is going to imply to the people that there's a rift. There's a rift between the prophet and the king, that basically Samuel isn't, good with any of this he's not you know he's not um he's not satisfied you know he's dissatisfied with saul being king okay so saul is really just imploring samuel to go with him so he's saying anything he can and doing anything hanging on his robe and tearing it in order to compel him to go with him then he said i have sinned yet honor me now please before the elders of my people and before israel honor me before the elders and the people before Israel, return with me that I may worship the Lord your God, not my God anymore. So Samuel turned back after Saul, and Saul worshipped the Lord. So Samuel agreed, and he went with him. Then Samuel said, Bring Agag, king of the Malachites, here to me. So Agag came to him cautiously, and Agag said, Surely the bitterness of death is past. This king, you know, wanting to save his own life, saying, Hey, you know, we're not in war right now, you know. Surely this whole thing is done, right? I don't know what you're doing here, but surely this is past by now, right? Then, uh, but Samuel said, "As your sword has made women childless, so shall your so, so shall your mother be childless among women." And Samuel hacked Agag in pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. This is a judgment. This is a judgment. Before. We judge God, and I'm not suggesting any of us do. Let's recognize who we are, all right? We make out so many things as good that aren't good. We think love is this vacuous thing. As long as you love somebody, as long as, then it's fine. Anything's fine. Anything's permitted as long as it's under the rubric of love. This undefined term, and we're going to get into that in the next message anyway, but before we start having any of these reservations and start thinking of God as this cruel, evil God, he has called Israel to himself. Just like the people of Christ, the Christians, the people of God, will be resurrected into eternal life. All the other people... The people who rebel against him, the people who are determined to hate him and continue to hate him, will be destroyed and abolished. Praise be to God. How do you have a perfect God and a perfect heaven and a perfect eternity with evil? How? You can't. you got to destroy the evil. One is by hanging his son on a cross. The other is by destroying them in fire. An eternal fire. If they will not have him, I will honor those who honor me. Those who despise me will be lightly esteemed. Again, we are going to get into this more in the next message. But, again, just before, before we start judging God, let's recognize that is not our place. Once we recognize that he is God... And he is altogether good. And he is condescended to send his son to die oh, the most terrible death. Then 
we can maybe consider these things in their true light. Okay? Okay. And again, we will consider that somewhat in the next message. And Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house at Gibeah of Saul. And Samuel went no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. So Samuel did him this one last favor, and then he didn't see him again until the day of his death. Okay, and we'll see. Saul seeks to kill Samuel after a time. Okay, the next chapter goes into David being anointed. Okay, but I did want to share just verse 16 because it goes back to Saul for a brief period. But the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. And a distressing spirit from the Lord troubled him. Remember God hardened Pharaoh's heart? He allowed Pharaoh all of his iniquity. Basically, the grace of God keeps men from absolute depravity. Total and utter depravity. Okay? Here, he, 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 he keeps back some of that. And let Saul be who Saul wants to be. You know, he's, he's causing all of this distress in the people. So the Lord is giving him a distressed spirit. And we'll see, that's what kind of causes his servants to call upon David. David's, David's able to play soothing music. And so that's what David becomes. That's what David starts to do. He's, he, come, he comes under Saul and he starts playing his music. Okay. So as we continue this series, I wanted to take the time to consider Saul because again, and we'll consider Ahab as well, likely this, this a terrible king, a wicked king. What we want to consider is God's faithfulness in even raising these men up and allowing them to come. Again, I think Saul was a judgment for the people. That You want a king like all the other nations? Here's a king like all the other nations. And then God says, I'm not having this. I'm not having this. This is not the kingdom I've established. And so I'm going to find a man after my own heart. And he does. He finds David, who is an amazing king. With all of his faults, he's not the Christ. He's not the Christ. But he is the one God calls. He's humble. He's of a low low clan of a low tribe he's very poor he's the youngest of all of his brothers he's a shepherd when when Samuel comes to an, to find the one the son of Jesse to anoint as king he goes through all you know the, the eldest is all handsome and everything and, and Samuel's like oh this has got to be the guy and God says don't look at the appearance don't look at the appearance I see the heart so God's teaching Samuel stop looking on the outside. That's what linked him to Saul. Saul was very handsome and he was very tall. David was rugged, but he was handsome. It says he was rugged, but he was handsome. But he was very young at this time. But, you know, Sam, he goes through all the brothers. And David was tending the sheep. How contrary to Saul. He's still hanging out with the sheep, doing his job. You know, he was called, you know, the prophet's here to anoint the king. David's like, well, that can't be me. <laughs> okay, I'm the youngest, and, I, and so I'm going to keep tending to the sheep. This is what needs to be done, so that's what I'm going to do. And so once Samuel goes through all the brothers, I'm sorry, we're going to look at this anyway, but <laughs> I find it fascinating as it, com as it compares to Saul. So he goes through all the other brothers, and he asks Jesse, you know, because none of those uh, God had chosen. And so he asks Jesse, are these all your sons? I mean, God called me to anoint one of your sons, and none of these are him. And he says, well, the youngest is in the back. <laughs> he's, he's tending the sheep. He says, bring him here. And God says, this is the man. This is the man. This is the one. This is the one. We are going to spend about four weeks considering David. Because I find it in the providence of God, you know, I didn't mean for this to happen, but in the providence of God, as we, can, as we go into the Christmas season, I think it offers us a great opportunity to see the fulfillment of Christ and stop thinking of what we're going to start doing in the next messages is looking at, the, looking at Christ's coming through the perspective of the Old Testament. And we'll get into that in the next message. So, in, to conclude, again, 
This is this man was anointed by God. He he served well for a very short period of time, and then he fell away. He fell away. He was not a man after God's own heart. He was a man after his own heart, solely for his own heart. Would would make pretenses like that wasn't the case, which we'll see. We'll continue to see. He wants to kill David. He almost kills David over and over and over again. Then he repents when when David spares him and all this. Um, but again, as we continue, I want us to. Re- we need to remember this account as well as we continue through the kingdom. But now we've been anticipating the beginning of the kingdom, and now we're here, and it begins with this dark fellow, with this with this man Saul, who God chose to fall. Let's not be shy about recognizing that. Let's not, and let's also try to recognize God's justice in that. Again, I think it was a judgment. People wanted a king like all the other nations, so God gave them what they asked for. Remember, be careful of what you ask for. Be careful of what you pray for. You might just get it. The people did. But then God's faithfulness raises up a man after his own heart, the one king who is so similar to his son, Christ. All right, praise God. Let's pray.